Welcome, welcome, fight fans. I'm excited to break down UFC Vegas 89, but not only because the card is not bad. We got a few interesting fights, a few interesting betting spots going on here, but because this is my first opportunity to work with a man that I've admired from afar for, for years and his work in the betting circles. I've tailed some of his picks. That is my guy, Hey Jive Picks. He's in for Maddie. Maddie, too busy betting March Madness underdogs to join us. I'm kidding. Of course, he just had some stuff coming up, but I'm glad Hey Jive is here. And he is here to help me break down UFC Vegas 89. So I have to bring him in and ask him the question that I always ask. Maddie, how you doing today, buddy? Great. Great to be here. Uh, last time I was on here, I was filling in for you. Now I get to film for Maddie, so I get a little bit of both perspectives. Uh, yeah. Just glad to be here. And, uh, you know, it's an Apex card. It's not like the, the greatest card, but I think there's some really good fights on the card. A lot of really close fights. You don't get a, mm -hmm. a card with, like, minus 500s uh like we had a couple weeks ago where it's like almost mm -hmm. every fight you're gonna have to pick between a minus 500 or some underdog that you could don't really think is gonna pull through so we got a lot of close fights mm -hmm. we're gonna break them down the best we can yeah absolutely and and both of us dfs guys so so i'm looking forward to it so why don't we why don't we dive right in here we'll take a look with 13 fights at ufc vegas 89 starting with one that i don't think is the lowest quality but it's an interesting opener at heavyweight mick barkin taking on mohammed usman a little bit of an up and down radar for these guys even though they're technically undefeated to this point at ufc we've seen some warts with both of them in how the individual fights played out I'm curious if you have a read on this guy yet. I, I do, but I don't have a strong semblance of confidence, so maybe you can give me some. Yeah, I, this is low-level heavyweights, and I hate betting on low-level heavyweights, but it seems like I'm always dragged into a spot where I end up doing so. And in this one, it's like choosing between two evils. Like We don't know if Mick Parkin is really any good. Didn't look good in his last time out when he was a minus 300-some favorite. Mm -hmm. Taking on Mo Usman, who's like, he's winning as an underdog, but it's against guys like Jake Collier, mm -hmm. uh, Junior Tafa, who has no takedown defense. It's like, I don't know if Usman has like good skills to really move up the ladder in the heavyweight division. Mick Parkin, maybe because he's younger, maybe a little more potential. Uh, and then with the line being the way it is, I'm tempted to just take an Usman play here because he can mix in the wrestling. He's got the dog in him, too. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's kind of showed that in his, his past couple of fights. It's like, all right, when, when he's getting hit, he knows he's got to shoot for the takedown. And if Mick Parkin can't make Usman feel threatened on the feet, then I think Usman could eventually take over. But ultimately, I think Mick Parkin's got the higher ceiling. Just mm -hmm. at this point, it's like, I don't know, maybe just a dog or pass. What are you thinking? Yeah, I, I totally agree. Like, the thing about... I thought I was going to be in an obvious position to fade Mo Usman here because I really hated what I saw in that junior Tafa fight, like not finishing him, not really getting into any sort of dominant position. That was a really bad showing. But honestly, his head defense was improved against Jake Collier. Jake Collier, even though he's not in shape, does have like middleweight level speed and skills at times that he can flash. And like, I think that was an encouraging sign for Mo. The thing, obviously, I love about McPark and training with Tom Aspinall is like that's as close as you can get to the divisional standards. So obviously, iron will sharpen iron in times. We've already seen a little bit of grappling upside with his submission on the Contender series. When Mo Usman was submitted in his last PFL fight, that is kind of the angle to this fight that I noticed most on FanDuel Sportsbook when we looked. Parkin by submission plus eight fifty. I think it's an interesting look when Usman probably will look to force the grappling exchanges. I think he will yeah. be behind on the feet a little bit, and he might be shooting on a guy in Parkin um that that has the ability to defend takedowns now that didn't go amazing for him in the in the Kyle Machado fight full disclosure I backed Kyle Machado in that fight so like I, I thought he was a good number it was a decently close fight I I'm not low on Machado but I think another thing to say here Mo Usman's in great shape at heavyweight you don't get that very often so if I were to lay on Parkin as I have he's in a parlay that I built earlier this week and then I end up losing because of the gas tank difference that's something that I kind of knew going in with with Parkin. I I got a pretty good number at like minus one forty five. I wouldn't straight bet Parkin at minus one fifty here, but I thought he was a decent parlay piece when I could I could formulate that with two other favorites that I like to come. In fact, a couple of favorites. I know one that you're already on because uh, if I haven't mentioned it already, the Home of Fight Discord. If you plug that here, great stuff going on in the Home of Fight Discord. Not only my picks, Hey Jive's picks. Um, we got Gilbert Burns on there. Maddie stuff is on there. So lots of good stuff if you haven't joined the Home of Fight Discord yet already. But I, I think I'm going to take a dart at parking by submission. I already put him in a parlay that I'm a little queasy about, but this is low-level heavyweight, like you said. 
Yeah, that submission number is actually pretty nuts because you look at Mo Usman, he's been submitted before. Mm -hmm. He is a little bit lighter for heavyweight. You know, if he could get reversed or something, Mick mm -hmm. Parkin's got that submission on the contender series. That's a crazy number. We don't mm -hmm. see a lot of submissions at heavyweight, but at that yeah. number, that might be uh, might be worth it. Yeah, I don't I don't know if we've seen a lot of power from Parkin to a point where I don't know how realistic a distance knockout type of outcome is right, here. Who's right. been showing a pretty good chin? I think instead of playing inside the distance or something like that, I I probably would take a dart at submission when I think it's the more likely finishing outcome of the two. Yeah, that's kind of why I'm like not super high on parking here it's like if he had yeah. some bigger power i'd be like yeah. more invested into it but like in the ufc we just haven't seen it so yeah it's it's interesting to me that he sits as a minus 150 favorite against an usman and last name usman undefeated 4-0 in ufc it's kind of weird like i wonder how the public is betting this fight when the line has kind of just stayed put i i actually had parking at minus 158 a couple days ago he's down to minus 150 so usman's taking on a little money here but um we, we've spent a lot of time talking about this fight when I don't think you and I have a strong, pretty angle. So I'll move forward to a one that I'm so excited to ask you about this fight because I think it's very interesting in that we don't have a great sample on either of these guys, but both of them have the potential to be special in UFC. That is Andre Lima taking on Igor De Silva at men's flyweight. I considered this one for my fight of the night. Igor just had that brutal beating. I, I forget. I think it was Jonathan Silva. Jonathan, it was one of the Jonathans yeah. on, on the Contender Series this past season. Um, steamrolled him second round. Andre Lima, weird, weird, different fight. It's like his opponent was in survival mode the whole time, but mm -hmm. um, really impressive, dominant victory in its own right. Do you have a lean on this with Lima coming back at minus 186? It, it seems steep, but um, I see both angles to this fight. Yeah, I mean, you kind of laid it out perfectly. Like, both guys, weird fights on the Contender Series. Like, Severino or De Silva or what, whatever his last name is. Sure, way. sure, sure. Uh, he basically he fought like an atom weight. Like, the guy was super small, and he just destroyed him. And then the guy that Lima fought was just running his entire the entire fight. Like, I didn't understand it whatsoever. I would have liked to see if Lima could engage in those those uh, scenarios and, like, show his skills because I think he's really skilled. You know, he's got yeah. a, a bunch of kickboxing, a bunch of Muay Thai fights. I think he'll be the overall more experienced fighter in there as far as, like, technicalities uh as far as the striking goes i expect mm -hmm. this fight to probably be like a fight of the night type of fight uh i could see igor mixing in some wrestling but i don't really see him like getting him to the ground and controlling him for you know two three minutes at a time he might just mix it in and that could get him the win if it does go to a decision and it's just back and forth on the feet igor's the guy that's mixing in the takedowns mm -hmm. but overall i think lima possesses a little bit more power a little bit more uh, diversity to his striking. And it looked like, to me, Igor is just a guy that's going to throw hard yeah. and, and try to expect it to land. It might land, uh, but both guys are young. They're both pretty durable. Both have never lost. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I think Lima is, is the rightful favorite. Is a little steep considering they're making a UFC debut, but he's going up against another debuter. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think Lima is probably the right side here. Maybe by decision. I don't know what the number is. Maybe you got the number. Yeah, we'll uh, take a look. Well, yeah, let's take a look here on FanDuel Sportsbook because I the total to me is somewhat ambiguous. Lima by decision plus 240. So most likely yeah. outcome fight Lima by KO plus 210. So odds makers are throwing their hands up a little bit with this yeah. specific outcome. They don't have a specific lean. Um, I, I think it's an intriguing fight on several levels. First with, with Igor, comes from shoot -a box and I don't think it's fully decided whether or not we're getting Melky Costa, Charles Olivero shoot -a box or we're getting Daniel Lacerda shoot -a box where right. it's like a reckless abandon for defense. He really didn't face any sort of adversity on the contender series, but still posted a 47% striking defense, wasn't forced to f defend a takedown. Those are concerning defensive metrics when I don't really know a lot about a guy, whereas Lima... Yes, he fought a better opponent in Rickson Zenadim, but Zenadim was kind of tentative. Um, but his efficiency was much better. 66% accuracy, 67% striking defense. Like, it is pretty perfect across the board. It looks like a guy whose volume wasn't great because of the fight environment, but the efficiency was solid. And you look at th them coming in. Lima at 25, probably a little bit more polished than 20-year-old Igor Severino De Silva, whatever, whichever right. last you want to go with he's 20 so you're not getting a ton of polish these shooter box guys they're sending in a few flyweight candidates we've seen lacerda felipe dos santos igor de silva so the room is not bad 
I'm just a little concerned that it might be a firefight in which Lima is a little bit more polished. Like I don't have mm-hmm. a bet on this fight specifically. Um, I was looking at, I think I was looking at the the inside the distance Lima by K or submission plus one fifty five against a shooter box who already has shooter box guy who already has defensive red flags. Seems like a decent number to me. I don't actually know at this point here on Thursday if I'll get to the window. Yeah, I, d- I don't know either. This is one that's. I looked at the over under two, and I initially wanted to play the under if because both guys have never been finished because they never lost. I thought maybe it'd be a little bit juiced to go to a decision. Mm-hmm. It was kind of like set even at, at the over under two and a half, and I'm like, yeah, it's probably about accurate. I don't want to get like too excited about that. Yeah, um, it's a tough one. Like it might be just one that you want to take off. And then the next fight, you got a little bit more uh, information on them to like yeah. play it. It could definitely be like a wait and see type of fight. I find it interesting. Um, I pulled De Silva at plus one twenty two on Sunday. He's plus one forty four now. So Lima's actually taking a little bit of money here. Public betting trends typically when you have two debutants, they tend to favor the underdog because, especially as the number gets wider, because if I'm yeah. getting two unknown commodities, I'll take the one at plus money typically. So a little interesting that Lima has ele- elevated there. But I came away from my research, my brief tape study that doesn't mean very much, thinking Lima was the more polished guy. So it's not yeah. overly surprising. I see that too. I see that too. Yeah. Yeah, so um, we'll just wait and see, and and we're not getting any more certain on some of these other early prelims coming in. Like usually, Maddie and I throw our hands up at this point on the Apex. Yeah. But how about debutant Daria Zelezhnikova? I thought I knew I was going to mess up that name here. Taking on Montserrat Rendon, only one of these ladies with a UFC appearance. It was Rendon who beat Tamiris Vidal by decision. I, I I love me some Tratora as a nickname, but didn't fight a great fight there. And now Zelezhnikova coming over. I think a lot of people are high on her because of a back and forth war in which she had success against Melissa Dixon. Dixon already a UFC winner. So this women's bantamweight division so badly needs talent. I think they are hoping Zelezhnikova can be that. Um, just some initial takeaways from you since I don't have any data on her. It, have you seen any of her tape and any first impressions of her? Yeah, I, I've watched a few of her fights. Um, I mean, we talked about low-level heavyweights, and so now we're moving on to low-level women's bantamweights. So it, it <laughs> gets even greasier. Uh, but Celeste Kova, the the tape that I watched, she just wants to stand and strike with you. She wants to get in close into a, somewhat of a boxing range, let mm-hmm. her hands go. And on the ground, if she's on top, she doesn't look too bad. But obviously, the loss to Melissa Dixon, she just got taken down. And she was like a fish out of water. It was like mm-hmm. she was piecing her up on the feet, gets taken down once. And she's like, oh, shit, I, I don't know what to do here. She got finished yep. in the first yep. round. So it's, it's scary. But then I look at Montserrat Rendon. I'm like, I watch her fights. She's older. I think she's 35 now. Yep. Um, she's doesn't have a lot of experience as far as professional MMA. I watch her strikes. They're very slow. I watched her fight with Tamir's Vidal. It's like, I don't know what was going on with Tamir's Vidal. I know she's not great, but like she didn't show much at all. It was like the first or second round and she's like circling the cage trying to get away from her. So I don't know if that was just a bad night for Vidal, uh, but Rendon got the win by split. Coming into this one against Jalez Nikova, I'm like, I don't know if she could pull it off twice where this girl is like not really going to come to fight. Uh, and I think Daria is the overall better skilled fighter in this one, but it's low level women's bantamweights don't really like taking women's uh, chalk to begin with, let alone yeah. that low of a level. But either way, I, I think she should probably get the win better skilled overall. It, the only way that I think Rendon wins this fight is if she can hold her up against the cage, limit the damage on the feet, but even then, we've seen with the judges, it's like the damage is going to trump anything that takes place on the cage or on the ground, unless you're landing some big ground and pound. So I guess probably Daria. Yeah, uh, I, it's I'm in the same spot here. We, we're not alone. Uh, Zelezhnikova was minus 180 on Sunday. She's now minus 230. So she's taking on a little bit of this favored money here. We can harken back last week to the Isaac Dolgari and Christian Rodriguez fight. This is a larger talking point for betting MMA in general. If you do not have damaging fight-ending actions, it is really hard to justify a bet on these fighters as they continue to lose decisions as the criteria is enforced more specifically. The thing about Montserrat Rendon, she just doesn't really have a lot of finishing danger. We haven't seen any jujitsu skills. Like you said, the punches were slow. There didn't appear to be a lot of power. Fandle's got her 12 to 1 to win inside the distance. So, like, 
if you dart her here at plus 176, you're looking for a greasy decision at best is what FanDuel is essentially telling you here. And like, mm-hmm. could she get it? Maybe like she hit three of five takedowns against Vidal. Zaleznikova has some has shown some bad work on bottom. I do think Melissa Dixon is a way better ground fighter than Rendon though, so I'm not as worried about like just getting stuck on bottom and it's a round one, round two TKO like we saw in that one. Um, but Rendon will not be scoring a lot given the current criteria and her efficiency against Vidal was really bad by the way, 37% striking accuracy, 44% yeah. striking defense. This feels to me like UFC would like to push Zelezhnikova. I do think she probably has top 10 hands in this division, like just entering. It doesn't mean very much given Yana Santos and Chelsea Chandler and Josie Nunez floating around the yeah. end of the rankings, right? It's not a strong group, but she does profile to at least, I mean, she was piecing Dixon up on the feet. I watched the whole fight between the yeah. two of them. Um, and then, like you said, one takedown ended the fight for her. So I just think Rendon's lack of finishing danger, Zelezhnikova is going to be the one scoring with strikes. Do I feel like sweating out a greasy decision at minus 230? She's plus 130 to win by points. That feels about right to me. Um, You know, you could potentially look to a knockout. She's shown regional power. I think actually five of her eight wins, if I'm not mistaken, are by KO. So, but that's regional power. Like she's the number one ranked women's uh, bantamweight in Russia. She's actually number one pound for pound now, giving that up uh, on Tapology joining UFC. She's a good prospect. Like, she's a good prospect, and I think Rendon was more of a throwaway that somehow got past Vidal, and now they don't really know what to do with her, maybe the other prop up Zelezhnikova. So it's kind of ugly, but it sounds like you and I are on the same page as as far as decently confident in a straight pick in in Zelezhnikova here. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. Cool. So um, we don't really have a lot of betting juice there. I have a little bit more here. I feel a little bit stronger about this next fight at um, at lightweight here between, or this, I'm sorry, this is a featherweight between Steven Nguyen taking on Jarno Ahrens, which uh, like both these guys have had really interesting, intriguing paths to UFC, very different ways of making it to the promotion and what we've seen so far. Um, with Nguyen, a pretty decent sized favorite, minus 194 on FanDuel when I pulled my stuff right before the show. So um decent chalk here again are you laying it with steven are you thinking more about a dog shot in this spot yeah this is one that is tough because i hate taking debut wins at at like two to one price tags Uh, but from what we've seen from like jarno warren's not super impressed uh the only bright spot for him i think in this spot is he's probably not going to get taken down like that's Mm -hmm. where he's struggled in his last two fights getting taken down giving up two or three minutes of control time on the ground, getting uh, damage done to him. Steven Gwynn's just like a boxer, high volume boxer. And I think that's probably the way he wins this fight is just based on volume and and marching the guy forward with aggression. Mm-hmm. Darn Awareness, if he's in a kickboxing fight, he's going to be a lot more alive. Sure. Um, so I'm kind of stumped in this one as far as is Gwynn worth the price tag of, of minus 190 or two to one uh, against Aaron's who hasn't, been impressive but like in this fight he's not gonna have to deal with his achilles heel yeah it certainly has been his achilles heel so far 33 percent takedown defense we haven't even seen an attempt from Nguyen through what is the best sample that i've seen from a contender series guy at this point he's got over 38 minutes in, in the tank already on the contender series so you learn a lot about tendencies that way and like you said high volume boxer attempts over 17 significant strikes a minute my fear for Aaron's here is that he just can't keep up because he was behind right. all, both of his prior opponents in distance striking pace. So not only was he getting taken down, Sung Woo Choi and Will, William Gomi were a little bit more active on the feet. Those guys are not active featherweights, like in a vacuum in general, whereas Nguyen, you profile him to be at least pretty active. The defensive stuff for Steven looks good too. 63% striking defense. 83% takedown defense, and I know Elon Cruz was a bum, didn't last very long in UFC. AJ Cunningham appears on the way to bum status, right? So <laughs> we're always dealing with the contender series stuff, but Aaron's has kind of proven to be a little bit of a bum himself as well. And and like, I don't know, hey, Jive, maybe, maybe you've heard from a distance. I'm not a Fortis MMA guy. I think Saif Sayud's ruined Brandon <laughs> Moreno. Um, like, I can't believe that Jeff Neal wasn't able to put on a more competitive effort against Ian Gary. Nguyen comes from Fortis MMA, but I do think he has a much better gym in this spot than Aaron's, who kind of trains, does his, it's a small gym in, in, uh, in the Netherlands that he trains with. It's not really like an American top team, a syndicate, anything like that. Um, so I think Nguyen is good, the better coach guy, the more polished guy. He's going to have the volume activity i think minus 194 is very fair he he 
is the other guy that I parlayed with Parkin on Tuesday. I, I have a plus 305 parlay over in the Discord. Um, and I felt like at worst his activity was going to carry him here. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think he probably just volumes his way to a decision. I think yeah. Aaron's will probably, if he starts getting hit, he'll probably try to circle the cage yep. um, and, and avoid that. At his core, he's a kickboxer. Really, the only good shot he's landed in the UFC was that uppercut on Song Wu Choi. Yep. Dropped him and then just completely screwed himself by like trying to go for a takedown after that and sure. lost the round on one of the judges' scorecard after he landed a knockdown. So, yeah, I would agree with you. I think Gwyn's probably the, the rightful winner. And uh, it does suck that he's coming out of four to seven May because after last weekend with uh, Kennedy and Zechukwu, I don't think I could ever bet on a four to seven May guy ever again because, yeah, wow. Yeah, you expected like the game plan. Like my my concern was we saw Kennedy do so well in his wrestling uh, against uh, Carl Roberson a, a few years ago, a couple years ago. Bruh, at least shoot for a takedown if you're getting pieced up by 40 year old OSP, right? Like <laughs> another thing to remember, it, we learned last week with OSP that I want to apply to my handicapping move forward. You saw to not here anymore, so that's something kind of to keep true. in mind um yeah. when we when we see OSP come from out of the dark. But you know, I think the biggest thing you said Aaron shot for a takedown. Nguyen's takedown defense thus far appears to be pretty good. That's both film study and, and the metric I referenced earlier. I think that helps him stay on the feet when you said Aaron's is not. That's him operating with his left hand. He would prefer to strike with wh whomever he's facing. I think if he's shooting takedowns in this fight, he's in big trouble. So yeah. um, so like I, I think Nguyen has him covered everywhere, so I can't wait to see Aaron's round one KO and and spoil my part. Because <laughs> like, I mean, that can't, I lost my last leg on Kennedy last week, so I really don't. I, I don't really know what to do at this point to, to cash one of those. But um, we'll move on here to a fight that you and I have both bet. It's over in the Discord, so I'm excited to hear your perspective about it because I've actually heard several other sharp guys that I talked to on the other side. I just don't get it. Miles Johns taking on Cody Gibson here at Bantamweight. Kind of a short-notice fight at 135. Um up and down careers for these guys to say the least with some of at this point, neither of them have what you would call a true quality win against a guy who's a bona fide UFC roster member. So this line is close for good reason. Uh, hey, hey Jive, I know you have already bet miles. Johns. you got him at a really good number. It looked like at minus minus one fifteen. explain your reasoning behind such. Well, you mentioned no USADA. So I yeah. mean, <laughs> Miles Johns got popped for his last fight and it turned into a no contest when he, yep. he got the win as an underdog. No, you saw it now. I mean, Miles Johns is probably licking his chops, <laughs> uh, but no, I mean, he's, he's four and two in the UFC. Uh, he's got a win on the regional scene against Adrian Yanez. He's taken on a guy in Cody Gibson. Who's 36. Uh, yep. He beat or didn't even beat Brad Katona. He lost to Brad Katona. He shouldn't even be in the UFC at this point. It was a great fight. But he lost, and he, he to get to the the ultimate fighter, he had to beat Mando Gutierrez, Rico DeSulo. and like he's beating these guys that just aren't aren't good. At this point, yeah. I just don't think Cody Gibson should even be in the UFC. Now, mm -hmm. could he go out there and pull something off against Miles Johns? Sure, uh, but Miles Johns, I think he's kind of reinvented himself since uh, that one or his last loss against John Castaneda. Comes back, it's a win. And then gets another win against Dan Argetta, who I rate pretty pretty solidly. I think with Cody Gibson, he's going to have him outmatched with the power. Uh, I think Cody Gibson showed in his last fight he'll fade eventually down the line. Miles Johns has had that problem too. Uh, mm -hmm. But if he's going to go in there, push the pace early, Cody Gibson's going to fade with him. So I would assume Miles Johns can mix in the wrestling, mm -hmm. uh, use his strike and use his more powerful striking. On the ground, he's got to stay safe. Cody Gibson's got some long, long limbs, um, but he was able to fight off the submissions from Dan Argetta. So I think Miles Johns is, is the side here. I love the price at minus 115. Like you're giving yeah. me a guy that is bona fide in the UFC against a guy that's 36 and probably shouldn't be here. I would take it all day. Yeah, absolutely. If he that feel that price felt like a Johns fade more than a Gibson back and like it's not a great sign that in your return to UFC, at least from a data perspective for me, you made Brad Katona look like Max Holloway in terms of efficiency and volume. I mean, Katona against everyone else has been this low volume wrestle grinder and he was just boxing up Cody Gibson. Yeah. So like Miles Johns isn't going to be a volume guy, but 48% striking accuracy, very good. 68% striking defense is elite. So 
I, I think a big weapon for Johns in this fight will be his calf kick to navigate some of that length with Gibson. And then the, this thing when you tape Cody is like he he has decent combinations. He has these fundamentals that look okay. And then he has a tendency to just royally fuck himself over and get himself hurt, make a big defensive mistake. And like mm -hmm. when you're talking about not a quality guy, when we refer to not UFC caliber, that's what we're talking about is you can make mistakes and it's a momentary lack of focus. I think that happens a lot with Gibson. I think Johns could lean on his wrestling in this fight. We've seen Gibson taken down before and controlled well. Um, I'm totally with you. And by the way, Miles Johns left Fortis MMA, now training with Trey Ogden and yeah. Garrett Armfield in that's Kansas. So that, I think that's a good move too. I think it's an upgrade given what we've seen from Armfield. And like Katona's UFC return against Armfield was pretty underwhelming. And now Gibson lost to him, had a broken orbital bone. I hate MMA math, like transitive like that. I get in trouble for it all the time where people yeah. yell at me about it. But like... I think there is a different plane here. I got Johns at minus 120, so I didn't get quite the same number you did. He's a little harder to justify because we've seen the gas tank um, go out at minus 150 on short notice. Like I think the number very much matters here with Miles. If you haven't hit John's money line and you wanted to support him, I think an interesting way, knockout plus 320. Not only am yeah. I talking about uh, at distance, he's had good power. Um, 0.89% knockdown rate, but also ground and pound because he hasn't shown a UFC submission attempt yet. So if he's in a dominant position on the ground, um, we haven't seen really a submission tendency yet. So I think that number is pretty solid. Uh, plus 320. I, I might end up sprinkling it in addition to my John's exposure, but this is a guy that hasn't been super kind to me. I, I lost on him against, um, I believe it was Mario Bautista at the flying knee. I lost on him against John Castaneda. So, um, I've been kind of screwed in this spot by Johns before leaving that behind, though. I think this is by far the least successful fighter of those three. Castaneda has a lot of pluses. Um, yeah. Bautista obviously Bautista. is great. Like he's in the rankings. Gibson, not even on the same plane. You know the uh, Johns submission number? Let's take a look. Um, it, I, mean, I mean, because you think of what Gibson has run himself into historically. He's been submitted in yeah. previous like you're thinking about his tendency there john's submission 16 to 1 on fanduel sports 16 to 1 <laughs> wow yeah that that's pretty damn juicy like i i cody gibson's a tough guy like we he took some big shots for brad katona brad katona is not like the most heavy-handed guy but i think john's club and sub could be live yeah and and another thing i want to get your perspective on since you've already bet on him I've heard a lot about like justifying John's a bet here because he's seven and zero in in decisions in his career. I don't think he has a I don't think he has amazing decision equity here. Like I think I'll be sweating if this gets to the scorecards right. with John's because Gibson's volume is better. Um, it meant that John's would have gone fifteen minutes, which may not be the best thing for his gas tank. Like I actually think that a longer fight here would favor Gibson, but. Johns has so much more power than Katona. I am almost looking at inside the distance. Instead of plus 320, maybe I just play it safe inside the distance, plus 250, um, and, and make sure I don't get get screwed by his first UFC yeah. submission attempt, you know? Of course. If you take him by KO, he's going to sub him. So. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that happens works these days. That's what happens to poor Maddie all the time. The Jillian Robertson thing in January was wild. She tried oh, like four submissions God. and then ended up beating her out of there. But um, – it, we'll we'll hope to avoid that outcome. I I'm glad you like Johns. I I I've heard like you know volume cardio arguments against him, but to me it's like this is 36 year old Cody Gibson. He yeah. may not arguably deserve to be here. I think when Johns came off the contender series, I thought he had like top 15 potential. Maybe doesn't have the volume in the gas tank to get to that spot, but I I mean he was in a fight with Hyoni Barcello, scheduled for that a couple like maybe about a year ago. I think that's much closer to his plane than this entry level that he's matched up with here on short notice. So. Completely agree. So um, we'll move forward here. A, a fight that I am I've also bet this, but I am interested to hear Hajive's take on it to see maybe I'm an idiot or not here at featherweight. Ricardo Ramos taking on Julian Arosa, quietly sneaky one of the better fights on the card here of a couple of guys that have won plenty in this featherweight division. Ramos coming off first round submission loss to uh, Charles Jordan had that guillotine choke. And then Julian Arosa has been knocked out in the first round a couple of times. So not super reliable parties to get your money here, but this is the UFC apex baby. And this is what we do for a living. Um, hey, Jive, what are you thinking in this fight with Ramos at minus 174 on FanDuel? I think you nailed it on the head. I mean, two unreliable parties. And by that means, I'd probably just take the underdog. And I think Julian Arosa with the experience... Uh, the skills he actually has overall, I think he might be the more skilled fighter in this spot. It's just like, will the chin hold up? 
yep. coming off back to back losses, might be time to write him off. But I don't think Ricardo Hamos has like, you know, hammers for fists. It might sure. not even take hammers for fists uh, because Julian Arosa's chin might be that bad. But at the mm-hmm. same time, it's like he's getting his KOs by spinning back elbow. Like, yeah. Other than that, he's not really putting dudes out. Uh, I know Arosa got knocked with a head kick from Caceres. Caceres doesn't have like any knockouts really. Uh, mm-hmm. And still managed to get the knockout. But I think Arosa is more skilled at this point. He's a bigger fighter. Uh, Ramos is a X 135er. Uh, just overall, I think the value here is on Arosa. I don't really like betting Ramos at, at chalk in any scenario, uh, unless it's against some complete bum. Uh, but ultimately, I do think I like violence in this one. Sure. I, I, I think the fight to not go the distance. I don't know what the line is. I think I. I'll probably take the under two and a half. I don't think I've put it in yet, but that's probably the biggest uh, or the most confident a bet I would put on this one. Yeah, I I like your violence take. Um, I the thing I would I would uh, argue with you though, if you're an Arosa backer, I feel like he has so much more decision equity here than Ricardo Ramos, just from his own volume, from his historical pace. Yeah, like I agree. that would favor Julian. And by the way, it means he didn't get chinned in the first two minutes, which is also good news if you back Julian Arosa in this spot. Um, I put two units on him plus one forty, so I have already bet Arosa in this spot and. I love this matchup for him because, like you said, Hamos is a spinning back elbow guy. Sure, he could get flying need in this spot. It's a certain possibility. But when you look at Ramos's data, 3.21 significant strikes per minute, 37% accuracy. So he's only attempting about 10 per minute. And some of that was at bantamweight. Um, he just doesn't throw a lot of volume out there. Where I'd be scared to death to back Erosa at this point is a guy like Fernando Padilla, who is a high-volume striker early. Alex Caceres is a pretty high-volume striker that'll walk him down. That's what I'm afraid of with Erosa's chin. I don't know if Ramos will give himself enough opportunities to find the chin early to a point where when you bet UFC fights, the power fades as these guys get tired a little bit. The chin, it becomes a little bit easier to, to take punches fresh, and there's not quite as much on the fastball, right? I think that's the concern here. And like, it wasn't that long ago that Julian Arosa dominated Hakeem Dowdu in every phase. Not only was he piece enough on the feet, he took him down, controlled him. And, you know, he looked huge in that fight. And like you said, Hamos is a former minus 135er. I, I feel like this line is totally representative of Erosa's chin. Um, and, and I, it is scary to go in and back him, but like Hamas, we just saw submitted. Erosa has a couple of submissions in UFC, and I tweeted it out earlier this week. This is a historically profitable spot to back a guy like Julian Erosa. Since returning in 2020 against Sean Woodson, he's four and one as an underdog, one and two as a favorite. So when Juicy J has been an underdog, he's been historically profitable. I think it's because he does have a lot of skills ahead of these guys that he ends up fighting in this area. He just has the chin concern, right? And like as you get. I, 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 the Padilla loss looks a little bit worse in hindsight after we saw Fernando in his last fight against Kyle Nelson. Um, but Ju, Ju, Julian's only 34. I don't think he's washed, washed completely yet. Um, so I'm going to take him against a former bantamweight, hope the chin holds. And I really think as long as it does, I think he's going to have more volume on the feet and could control this as the larger guy on the map. Yeah, I'm really like trying not to agree with you on every fight, but I completely agree. I think Eros is like, the, the underdog side in this fight is the, the side to be on because, like you said, he's profitable as a dog. Uh, he's got all the skills to do it. And what what's the Rosa decision number? Let's take a look here. Uh, oh, oh, I know I had it circled because I noticed it. It was it's five to one, which like to me, five to one. I, I think he should be favored in a market. FanDuel doesn't offer these. Some other books do like um, decision only. So if it ends early, your bets void. I think Rosa should be favored in that type of market. And I don't think yeah. he is if I've checked a couple of books. Yeah, I, I looked at the Rosa by sub. I like that number. Um, but now that you say decision, it's actually pretty interesting because I kind of see De- Akeem Dawadu, a similar type of fighter of like yep. Ricardo Hamosh, like lower volume, yep. uh, going to sit there and try to f- like pick his shots, yep. maybe mix in some takedowns. So, I mean, it's not a bad number by any means. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I, I tend to lean that I, I tend to lean toward a little bit of length here. Although, like you said, you've got the chin, you've got submission vulnerabilities. Like when you say violence, my initial thought was, yeah, that's a good, that that's the most likely outcome of the fight. But then mm-hmm. the point of prop being at five to one is what's so enticing. It's not the most right. likely outcome, right. but it is a long number. Now you put out a play in the discord earlier this week's Erosa significant strike spread here, plus two and a half. 
I, I mean, you don't often see it favored in the underdogs direction. I have no idea how it wouldn't be favored here. If you, if you like DFS apps, Erosa more efficient striker, 48% to 37%, and nearly doubles up the volume as far as landed per minute. So I loved that look when I saw it from you earlier this week. Yeah, I love doing that. When you get – because all, almost all the time when uh, an underdog – on underdog fantasy, when the favorite is going to be given like more uh, – I don't know how to say it, like more significant strikes. Like Erosa yep. throws a lot more volume, but he's the underdog in the spot. Yeah. So like underdog fantasy is going to put him at a disadvantage going up against Ramos, but like historically Arosa just lands way more than, mm-hmm. than uh, Ricardo Ramos. So, I mean, I love doing those spots. We find them almost every week where you get a betting underdog that just clearly throws way more volume than the other guy. And right. they're just going to be given a great price. So I love doing that. <laughs> he could get knocked out in the first round and still cash that significant spread. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, I think, uh, in his last two fights, like he got knocked out, but he's still covered yeah. like four and a half strikes, significant strikes or something yeah. like that. So, and, and you know, the reason for that, the simple math behind it is over 70% of the time in UFC, the fighter that lands more significant strikes wins. I know that sounds like kind of a dumb guy stat, but it does provide value when, when certain fantasy platforms, I, you know, I, I, with the loyalty behind me, I, I only talk about FanDuel, but when they offer, um, when they offer a prop like that, they're saying this guy's favored to win. He's most likely going to score more significant strikes. You look at 30% of the time. That's not true. And I think you found an exception here where Erosa, even in defeat might, might, might be the right side there. So um, great stuff. I love Erosa is like a daily fantasy play. I think FanDuel salaries probably came out while we were on this show. So um, I I don't have them to talk about. I love Erosa is like a value play type of guy when we really don't have that many. And I think his floor is like sneaky high, which sounds absolutely stupid to say for a guy that's been knocked out in the first like in the last two fights but i think his four is sneaky high ramos is a good matchup for him but we'll move on here to the fight that is um second to last prelim here i at least think we've got a five card main card i'm pretty sure it's billy q that's leading off anyway um lightweight trey ogden taking on kurt holabout so we see another of the ultimate fighter alum making kind of his return ish fight since leaving the show setting Olabella plus 118 dog. Trey Ogden kind of robbed in his last fight. I mean, he clearly submitted Nicholas Moda, if not for a refereeing mistake, was called a no contest, but Dana paid out his win bonus anyway. So I think he's coming off a win. Now taking on Holabau, who submitted Austin Hubbard on the Ultimate Fighter. Um, curious about your lean on this one. Uh, Ogden coming back at minus 150. Yeah, it's another one. It's like the Ultimate Fighter winners. Like, we all watched that season. Like, the season yeah. sucked. Like the yep. fighters on the season were absolutely terrible. Like Kurt Hollibaugh, to get back into the UFC, beat Lee Hammond, who went back to the regional scene, lost, got knocked out. Jason Knight, who went to bare knuckle or game bred bare knuckle, got knocked out. <laughs> and then Austin Hubbard. Like, it's like that's that's way easier than uh, going on to the contender series and fighting some other guy that's like young and up and coming. So I don't know if I could like get behind a 37 year old Kurt Hollibaugh. Yeah. But at the same time, like he does throw a lot of volume. He does have some pretty good BJJ, especially off his back. He's going to be an aggressive guy. Yep. And Trey Ogden in fights where, you know, he's going up against an aggressive striker. It's like, it's tough for him to put in his game plan. Like the fight against Zell Huber, Zell Huber just like, wasn't throwing much. And Trey Ogden yep. just kind of led the dance. Uh, in fights that Trey Ogden can lead the dance, he looks really good. But like mm-hmm. against Bahamondes, Bahamondes was just doing anything he wanted to him. Yep. It's it's another one of these spots. Like you don't know which Trey Ogden's going to show up that night. Um, but at the end of the day, I think Trey probably has the better skills at this point to get it done. Now I say that like with a little bit Watch of a wince yeah. because I'm like, yeah. I don't know, like Kurt Holobaugh is, is 37. He's, he's kind of a dog. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't have like a super big lean on this one. Yeah. It's one where like, I don't know which version of Trey Ogden's going to show up. I don't know where Kurt Holobaugh is at. Like he's 37. Yeah. He can't expect him to like have a longer UFC career ahead of him. So, I mean, like, what is he doing at this point? Just getting yeah. a, you know, a few paychecks or what? So I don't yeah. know. I'm, I don't have a big lean. Yeah, neither do I. I. I may not get to the window with this fight in general. Um, 
the thing about that Zell Huber Ogden fight, I think it's the most notable example mentally for me in recent, like post COVID UFC, of first fight jitters. Like if they rematch Zell Huber and Ogden today, Zell Huber would be minus 400 and he'd probably finish him inside the distance. Like mm-hmm. Zell Huber was very tentative in that fight. We know who the better fighter is now and, and we've seen the skills that he's developed at Extreme Couture. I think Ogden is as coasted a bit off that. Now, Bohemondes was, I mean, Bohemondes didn't take any risks in that fight whatsoever, and, and Ogden couldn't find him. I just have a hard time seeing where Ogden dominates this fight at minus 150, and I think that's my reservation because he had a hard time taking down Jordan Levitt. He um, has had a hard time really taking down almost everyone except Nicholas Moda, and Moda is kind of a, a zero in the grappling department, kind of a KO or bust type of guy. Whereas, like, Holabau, he's kind of a dog. You know, he, he takedown defense isn't perfect. He's willing to eat punches at times. I don't think Trey's a super big power puncher. I think the volume in this in this fight slants whole about, but like at 37, can you count on reliable volume for what you're hoping for? And like, I, I think the grappling is decently even. It's so weird to me. Ogden, I, I profiled him coming into UFC as a submission guy. Um, he has one attempt, I think, and he, and he didn't convert it. Um, like, well, I mean, he did convert it, but it wasn't officially listed conversion because yeah. of the refereeing mistakes. So, like, I expected more from him at this point. I think Holabau's BJJ can keep him safe in spots here. It's interesting to me, FanDuel kind of had the same lean that I did with minus 122 to go the distance. I think that's the best play in this fight, is this fight to go the distance, because I don't know what tools Ogden has to get Holabau out of there, and I know Kurt's a tough guy. At the same time, I think Holbao is working at significant athletic disadvantages here to Ogden, who's a guy who's very smart. His, his coaching career is honestly probably going better than his UFC career at this point. I just think these are two heady veterans, not a lot of skill separating things here. So like my strongest lean is to go the distance, and I I don't even know if I'll bet it in the spot. Yeah, I don't mind that because uh, I think if, if Trey Ogden gets him down, uh, that's usually where he, he does his best work when he's on the ground. He's not like a guy that's – you know, going to be throwing up triangles from his back. Like, that's more mm-hmm. Kurt Holaba. I think yep. they probably just cancel each other out. Um, maybe you get something with, like, a Kurt Holaba snatching something up, like we saw yeah. it on in or against Austin Hubbard. Yep. But every time I watch that, I'm like, what is Austin Hubbard doing? Like, he'd, like, let him <laughs> lock it in. He was just, like, sitting there letting him lock it in. I'm like, I, yeah. do you not know this is coming or what? Like, I, I don't know if Kurt's just got that good of, of a triangle choke or what, but he got it done. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, this is one that I'll probably just lay off. Yeah, I, I, you know, that was an impressive win to me when I, I thought Hubbard was let go from UFC a little prematurely when his losses were to Joe Selecki, Mark Madsen, like, and he went the distance. It wasn't like a route in a lot of those. I think he was subbed in the first round by Selecki, got his back early, you know, it can happen. But I think Hubbard is like a fringe UFC caliber guy and really Holabau was the better guy in both domains. He, he was kind of hurting him on the feet. Like you said, maybe a mistake by Hubbard to let him sink in the choke. Um, and Roosevelt Roberts is the other guy on this past Ultimate Fighter season that was probably worth anything. And like Holabau uh, or Hubbard went through him. So like by transitive property, Kurt Holabau's level of competition is okay entering this one. Like you said, it's so tough. to. I, I don't really want to put money behind these Ultimate Fighter guys at a number as short as plus 120 because it's it's been really bad, like results across the board. Think of Juliana Miller. Think of Ricky Tercios. Like these are not guys that are, especially they're not winning in emphatic yeah. fashion. Ryan Battle is probably the exception to the rule at this point. So He's the um, only guy. Only guy yeah. the Ultimate Fighter's got <laughs> at this point. Yeah, I mean, like, because they're mining the best young talent for the Contender Series. So we have to keep that in mind. We got to remember it. I I think I might, if I get to anywhere in that fight, it probably is go the distance just because the number is shorter than I was expecting. But both of these individual outcomes, Ogden by points plus 150, the most likely outcome on FanDuel, whole about by points at plus 460, the next most likely outcome. So they're kind of leaning decision above all, not really sure how these guys' tools match up. So uh we'll move we'll move on so we don't have to talk about kurt holabau anymore and you know <laughs> nothing against kurt like he's doing the best he can like you said what 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 championship future is there who knows but um an interesting clash of guys that at one point were highly rated prospects i think fernando padilla definitely still could qualify um did was not his best night at noche ufc against kyle nelson he's taking on luis pachuelo here off of the contender series 
Pojego, very impressive. And this guy is not short on aggression. Another one of these Peruvian guys that we saw um, coming out of the Contender Series. Some of them, Daniel Marcos, very successful. Um, I'm trying to think of the guy that fought Diaz on the Contender Series. Uh, Borges, Kevin Borges, right? Had a good fight with Josh Van. So this country sort of exporting MMA talent in. Pojuelo, the most recent of those. Um, Padilla at minus 174 here with the UFC experience. Do you have a, a strong lean in this guy? I love the Peruvian fighters just because they're so damn tough. And they, they are just tough. go in there and they just want to scrap. Like they want to yep. get inside into boxing range and just let it fly. Uh, and they have good skills too. And they always have seem to have like some pretty solid cardio. Like they're, yep. they're from Peru. If I'm correct, like Peru's massive Way up elevation. There. So yeah. yeah, if you're training in Peru, uh, you're probably going to have some good cardio. But I think in this one, with the... Uh, the fight that we just watched with Padilla and Nelson, mm -hmm. it kind of makes me uh, question like how Padilla can handle a guy that's just going to come forward and sure. is durable, has good cardio, and is not really going to, you know, blink if, if you're throwing something at him. I think that's what Pajuelo is. He's just a guy that's going to walk you down. Uh, he's got good hands. He's tough. Uh, and Padilla, I think he needs to at least mix in some type of cage control or just to like slow him down. Cause if he's going to try to fight off the back foot, the entire fight, I don't think it goes well for him. So he's either got to crack Pahuel with something early, get some respect there. Uh, yeah. Otherwise Pahuel, I think is just going to keep walking him down, throwing shots. Um, and Padilla is going to be in a, a world of trouble. If he can mix in a, a takedown, I think he could expose some grappling issues for, for mm -hmm. Pahuel. Uh, but we haven't really seen him shoot any takedowns. So I don't know like how his wrestling is. He does have a lot of submissions on his record, but I think those are more like defensively because he's a tall yep. guy. Probably yep. most guys want to get him to the ground and, yep. uh, you know, take away that length. But I don't think Pajuelo is going to do that. Um, maybe no. he does, and maybe that would be a mistake. But I would expect Pajuelo to just try to throw hands with him. And uh, maybe he can catch him with something, but Padilla's never been finished. I'm honestly thinking maybe a Pajuelo by decision. Uh, mm -hmm. just based on volume and damage. Uh, but I don't know. What are you thinking? I'm so glad you like Boelo here. It's weird that it, HIV and I do things a little bit differently. It's weird that we've come to such similar results here this week because I like Boelo too. I already bet him at plus 140. I, the way that he fought on the contender series, he's not only going to be fun, but it's going to be effective. 61% striking accuracy, 62% striking defense. I think the concern is the grappling here, but it, I already had this circled too. No takedown attempts from Padilla yet. And the biggest thing that I have on watch for him after that fight against Nelson, the the two red flags, I don't know which one it is, but he either lost his confidence by a tremendous amount when he realized he wasn't going to get Nelson out of there after a pretty strong first round, or his gas tank gave out. I don't really know which one it is at this point, but the gas tank concern is a huge deal. Peru, by the way, 5,100 feet above elevation, so basically like Denver. Um, it is a high elevation place to train. These guys push a tremendous pace, and if Padilla's gas tank struggled against Kyle Nelson, oh boy, do you have another thing coming against a guy throwing 18 significant strikes a minute at you that, that's tough and super durable. Like, I, most of the Padilla submissions I've seen as well were defensive. I think it is like guillotines, like things off of his back. And he does have very long limbs and appears to have good skills there. Um, I kind of feel like Padilla is like a quick knockout or, or like a, a, gu a guillotine, like a club and sub type of guy or bust in this spot because I see Puello as the minute winner. I have fewer concerns, as weird as that is to say off the contender series, because I'm not super worried about the gas tank. I'm not worried about his accuracy when Padilla... 38% striking accuracy. And look, this is a dude in Kyle Nelson that went life or death with Jai Herbert. Billy Quarantillo absolutely destroyed him. Like we have a measuring stick on Kyle and it's not Blake Builder. Uh, like he looked like Blake Builder and how Bel Blake Builder fought Kyle Nelson. That's really concerning at minus 174. I, I totally think this is a dog or pass spot. And here's another calf kick watch for you with a lar large reach disadvantage. We've seen Daniel Marcos have a really nice calf kick. Um, so kind of coming out of the same same areas. I actually don't know if they're training partners, but um, so I don't want to be xenophobic and be like, he's got a calf, <laughs> so have a calf kick. But I think it's a good approach against Padilla with his length. Um, so calf kick watch here too. Yeah, I like it. I think uh, just the, the toughness is there for Pueblo. Like he's going to yeah. go in there and, and fight for your dollar. And at, at the underdog money, I, I, I'll take yeah. it all day. Yeah, so violence here, minus 166, fight minus 166 to not go the distance. Most likely outcomes, Padilla by points, plus 260. Padilla by KO, plus 260. Pueblo yeah. by point, plus 420. 
which is yeah, equal see, parts like, nice and Tyson. If they think uh, Padilla by points is the biggest or the most likely outcome, like I, I wouldn't like that whatsoever. I don't see it. I don't see it. Yeah. Uh, Just based on volume and, and accuracy, I don't see that. That's red flags to me. Yeah, I think I think if you take a position on Pajuelo here, Fernando Padilla by submission plus six fifty, like that yeah. is where Pajuelo's biggest work weaknesses is. And I do this with Maddie sometimes, where he'll actually take a position on both fighters in a fight. You know, mm-hmm. maybe maybe you go Pajuelo points KO, um, whatever that comes out to be. Let's see what points KO looks like. Uh, plus one fifty, and then if you take a decent position there, plus six fifty for with Padilla with the submission hedge might be a way to do that. Yeah. Now, Maddie yeah. loves long shot. I use them more as hedges. He loves long shots to just hit him and make make awesome reaction videos. That's what he does. Uh, but like, um, I, I I think that's an obvious spot to hedge here, and maybe maybe with Padilla. Like, would you think his finishing equity? Are you do you have the same concerns I do about his gas tank? Where maybe you even go round one two sub because like I don't know what he's gonna have in round three based on that Nelson fight. Yeah, I, I would agree. I would agree. I think if he does it, it's probably round one or two, and yeah. it's probably uh, Pajuelo like cracks him with something and, and maybe shoots some sloppy takedown or, or clinches up against him and Pajuelo, or Padilla snatches something up. Uh, I, but yeah. Uh, hey, Jack, early. you're giving me post-traumatic stress disorder to dudes who hop on top against a guy with a good submissions off their back oh. after they hurt him and ended up getting yeah. grabbed in armbar or triangle. You give me PTSD. Yeah, it's like, just let him up. Just let him <laughs> up, man. Why yeah. are you going down there? Why are you going yeah. down there? Luis, if if you, for whatever reason, hear this obscure podcast or, or YouTube video this week, please don't shoot takedowns. That's my only advice. Please don't shoot takedowns this week. I, I, think, I think I think you'd be best served by standing. So kind of in a dogger pack, I, I need more data on Padilla before I feel comfortable anywhere close to yeah. this number. So um, maybe we'll get it on Saturday. Maybe he'll look a lot better than I thought. Maybe it was a bad weight cut or something. You never know with these small samples. So uh, we'll move on to guys that have larger samples up on the main card. And I'm very excited to ask K Jive about this next fight here. Um, Billy Quarantilla, Billy Q back um, taking on Yusuf Zalal on short notice. I'm glad to see Yusuf back in the UFC, man. He got a tough draw with Ilya Taporia and some of the other guys that he ended up having to fight um, through his tenure. Jamon Blackshear has ended up being a really solid guy. Um, So it's good to see him back here. He's actually a pretty short underdog in this spot against an accredited name like Billy Q. Um, I know you've got a lean in this fight, but why don't you tell the, the fine folks in the audience what it is? Yeah, so I locked in Billy Q on the money line at minus 148, and now it looks like that's a bad bet because I'm getting some some negative closing line value. Mm-hmm. But in the past weeks, I've been getting some pretty positive closing line value and still <laughs> lost, so it seems like it doesn't mean anything. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I took Billy Q, uh, for the fact that I just think Yusuf Zalal, he's a low volume striker. He doesn't get hit with much, so it's not like he's he's getting outstruck by a lot. But mm-hmm. I think Billy Q is just levels above him as far as volume goes and pressure. Now I don't think Zalal is gonna like wilt to the pressure by any means. I think he'll probably be able to flow it in some scenarios. Yeah, but Billy Q is just gonna have more output as far as striking goes, as far as takedown goes, just overall aggression. And I think he probably wins the fight at least six, maybe seven out of ten times. Yeah. By those those uh, predictions, like I, at minus one forty eight, I think it was the side. Uh, but I see a lot of love for Yusuf Zalal, and I don't mind it. Yeah. But you know his wins in the UFC weren't very good. No. He did get some tough draws. I mean, he, he's faced good competition, but at the end, he's still losing the fights. And then yep. he had the draw uh, with Damon Blackshear before he got cut. Damon Blackshear is a 135-er. Right. He got smoked the first two rounds, and then Blackshear completely gasped because it was on short notice, mm-hmm. and uh, he gets a 10-8 in the, in the third, and it's mm-hmm. a draw. He gets cut. So it's like, okay, his last four UFC opponents, he's pretty much lost to. So I, yeah. I think Billy Q, with the experience in the UFC, should be able to beat Yusuf Zalal. Yusuf Zalal is a UFC fighter for sure, but yeah. at the price that minus 145 when I got it, I'm like, I think he wins six, six or seven out of 10. So I got to yep. take it. I'm with you. I got worse closing line value than you. I got minus 150. So, um, <laughs> it's just like, so, but I've tweeted, I joke about it all the time that closing line value means you are dust in UFC. Shout out Bulgarian betters last week. My favorite one was calling that it was coming with Malcolm Gordon. I'm like, you guys are betting Malcolm Gordon at minus 210. And it ain't going to end well for you. But, yeah. um, like, like, 
the thing about Zalal, I think this is a good matchup for Billy, even though I'm concerned about him a little in general in that he's now 35. I think that the cardio advantage that he has had historically as he was younger might wane a little bit in the coming years. So I'm very trepidatious around him. Poor striking defense, which we saw bite him against Edson Barbosa, even though that was just one really sick knee, right? And then he's never he's never been a super great takedown defense guy. We saw Gavin Tucker kind of ragdoll him around a few years ago. And these kids these days, they won't know how good Gavin Tucker was before the chin and the body started giving out on him. Gavin Tucker was kind of – Gavin Tucker was really, really good. I, I think most people remember him for the Ige fight where he got knocked out in seconds. But Zawal's takedown efficiency is not quite that good. Like you said, a lot of it came against guys who were not – very strong in UFC. He had a hard time taking down Sean Woodson. He had a hard time taking down, I mean, like everybody except Peter Barrett, pretty much 31% takedown accuracy. So I don't know how much success he's going to have Zalal Will trying to replicate that Tucker result where it was just chain wrestling, keeping Billy from being able to get to his own offense. Whereas Yusuf Zalal, you look at, at, at who he's fought, Sean Woodson, I think, is a decent comparison as far as volume that Billy will throw out there. Billy's just kind of violent. He's nasty, by the way, too, with elbows and things that score well with the judges. I don't know if he can get Zalal out of there because he's got pretty great defensive metrics. He showed to be durable in his UFC career thus far. I think the point about Blackshear, where he was losing that fight to a 135-er, there could be a difference in physicality here. Like Damon Jackson, to me, better wrestler, better grappler than Yusuf Zalal couldn't really control Quarantillo for moments that mattered to get the nod in that fight. So yeah. like, I think this is a good price on Billy too. And it's kind of like the weird chalky side because Billy's a fan favorite Billy, you know, Billy's been around longer, but I think, you know, some are just looking at Billy's recent results that haven't been amazing. And they're kind of backing Zawal because of where he comes from. Zawal hasn't really fought anyone regionally that provides me any hope that he's a significantly different guy than when he left. And if he's not a significantly different guy than when he left, I think Billy Cruz is here. Yeah, I see a lot of people on the Zawal side. Yeah. Uh, just for you the do. fact that I, they think he could keep up with the pace of Billy Q uh, and, and move through the scrambles and stuff like that. And I see it, but at the end of the day, I just, I just feel like Billy Q's going to have more output overall and should be yeah. able to win. I mean, the scoring moments are going to be the issue for Zawal if he hasn't really adapted in that differently because he didn't show a lot of submission volume, especially against the high-level guys, and then just 2.75 significant strikes per minute. Like, it was more about the position. Well, you know, Billy will throw elbows off his back hit. Billy will do all sorts of weird stuff in the strike, and it is insane volume that he puts out there, over seven significant strikes landed per minute. So, like, um, I like Billy in DFS formats this week, like, just because his pace, his money line is going to keep him at a salary lower on a place like FanDuel or that other place that I typically don't try to reference. His money line is going to keep his salary a little bit lower when I still think he's got really high upside, as he usually does because of his cardio and his output. Mm -hmm. I agree. So, so uh, really, really interesting fight uh, that it, I, I see this law love too. I don't really get it. I talked to one of my sharpest guys that I don't really do film stuff. So I have a couple of guys that I lean on for that. One of them loves Billy. Haven't heard back from the other one yet. So I'm, I, I, I know Clint McLean was a guy that was on Zalal. He went Link Dog of the Week, which is a very prestigious <laughs> honor. I, I don't necessarily see it. Now, I will say if you got Zalal at plus 135, plus 140, it was a significantly better number when it might have been hanging out there. But weird line. I, CLV doesn't mean anything to me in UFC. I, I'm not. I'm fearless, bro. I've lived through enough Isaac Dolgarians that I'm yeah. not. <laughs> that I'm not bothered by it. So we'll move on here to a fight that also had a little bit of line movement that we'll talk about this week. It's the people's main event, the MMA betters main event here, Peyton Talbot taking on Cameron Simon second week in a row where they loaded the main card with a superstar prospect matchup. Like both of these guys were the next big thing at some point in UFC. I still think both kind of are in, in some circles, um, really high level prospect fight here. I can't wait to see which one of these guys wins out as we get more data on both um, do you have a lean in this guy here? Because I actually sense we might have a little bit of disagreement, which will be better for the audience. Yeah, for for once, we might have a disagreement. Uh, <laughs> but this is like I said, it was the most controversial fight this weekend because it's like you're on one side or the other. These are two upcoming <laughs> prospects that have showed a lot of promise. One of them coming off a loss, first career loss uh, to C-Rod. Yep. And it wasn't uh, it wasn't like a bad loss by any means. Uh, because C Rod's a 145er at heart, and yep. he was definitely a 145er in the cage that night. So you can't yep. really knock him too much for that. Uh, but Simon going up against Peyton Talbot, he's going up against another guy that's that's bigger than him, uh, is longer than him, has more output than him. The only thing that really scares me for Talbot 
is the wrestling, like yeah. getting, getting grappled up, and the fact that he could probably drop round one. Like that's that's the biggest issue for me on the Talbot side. But other yeah. than that, I feel pretty confident that he can out volume him. He's going to land the bigger punches, might be more durable, uh, and he's just going to outwork him. I think he's a way better athlete. He's twenty five, so he's in like the prime. I think physical prime as far right. as like getting all this muscle like i'm 24 and uh you know, i work out like every day and i, I feel great i feel great like i feel yeah. like I could, I could still like compete in something and yeah. i can't imagine if you were 25 you've been been training for the last you know four or five years in this sport like you're gonna feel at a great point in your physical prime cameron simon's 23 but you kind of look at him, he's like, all right, he's still probably growing into his frame a little bit. You know, like, he might be a little bit uh, behind Peyton Talbot as far as physical maturity goes. Like I said, the only thing that scares me for Talbot is getting grappled up. But I don't think Cameron Simon has the abilities to, like, get him down, hold him down to the ground for lengthy periods of time. Uh, and I think in the scrambles, Peyton Talbot should be able to get back up to his feet and get back to work. And we've already talked about it on the show before. It's like whoever's working more with yep. uh, the damage, I think Peyton Talbot's going to wear the damage better too. Like yeah. Cameron Simon's pasty white. I'm pasty <laughs> white, so I get to say that. Uh, but like, <laughs> if you're pasty white, it's never a good look to the judges if you got like blood on your face. Peyton Talbot is a darker pigment, and yeah. he has a great, he's great durability, durability, a great chin. I think he'll wear the damage better. I think it could be a three round uh, battle. And yeah. I think Penn Talbot should probably get his hands raised. Yeah, and so you and I are going to try to build a parlay at the end of the show that hilariously might be better than the results Maddie and I usually get, which we <laughs> hold, out, hold over him forever. But um, I actually like goes the distance at minus 172 is like a parlay piece here. I think it is a three-round war, and that's what makes betting like a side in this fight so interesting in that – I think both guys are going to have moments in this fight. It might look a little bit like that Rodriguez Simon fight where Simon was in control of some exchanges and then C-Rod would counter. And, they, and then, like you said, Simon looks like he was going up against a much bigger, more physical guy there. And even though he's got more UFC experience, he is young. I mean, he debuted so young at 21. Yeah. Like, I call him mini Drykus, even though he fights very differently than Drykus. It's like they just train together and like the well-roundedness aspect is there. But like... I think the thing that makes handicapping this fight so hard is how much better they are than each other's respective best opponent to this point, right? Like we saw Cameron Simon dominate Terrence Mitchell in the grappling. How much does it mean as far as his UFC level grappling against a guy like Talbot? We saw Talbot, you know, he was able to hold off the wrestling advances of Nick Aguirre, ended up death gassing and submitted him in the third round. Well, how does that end up holding up against a guy like Simon who has shown some grappling upside? Like that's what makes this so interesting. I have a lean toward plus money. I haven't bet it yet. And like, I see a plus 118 on FanDuel. I don't love that number. I would prefer like plus 130 or plus 140 because, like you said, Talbot has a lot of physical advantages in this. Not only is he older and more mature, but the reach advantage could be an issue. Like, Talbot uses his reach really well. He uses his legs and his hands as far as like a range finder. Um, I was very high on Talbot coming off the contender series. The Aguirre fight scared me to death, but it was also a weird matchup against a guy who was a D2 wrestler. Like it's very different than what Simon will, will project. I think Simon's got like better. He's got better lateral movement. I think his low kicks are, are better. Like I feel like he's a little bit more polished and like stance switching and things like that. But then at the same time as somebody who backs Simon against Rodriguez, I thought he took a horrible approach fighting that fight, trying to out grapple C rod with such a weight disadvantage. Like I wish he, he would have stood and tried to trade more. I think fight IQ might be a little bit more in Talbot's direction at this point. So I, I kind of lean Simon at this area, but I'm not exactly going to go to the window. If I, if I could do it over again, I would go back to Sunday when Talbot was minus 110 and I would grab him at a pick him. Uh, but I can't do that. So I'm, I think what I'm going to do is I might just parlay fight goes the distance here and enjoy the show with everybody. This is going to be my fight of the night when I do my podcast and, and my written article tomorrow. I, I think it's an obvious choice between these guys and the way they fight. Yeah, I think, uh, well, I, I got Talbot at minus 115, and then it, yeah. like, steamed within the next couple of days to, like, minus 150, minus 160. I think a little bit of love came back for Simon. Yeah. Uh, and I, at this point, it's like I'd probably still take Talbot at, like, minus 150, but I wouldn't sure. be as, you know, excited about it as minus 115. You know, it's, yeah. it's tough to, like, get excited about it when you got the better line. There's CLV there, so it's probably not going to hit. So you might be good on the Simon <laughs> side if it ends up closing at minus 150. 
Sure. Yeah, and like that's that's my fear is that I saw my buddy Clint come through with like seven units on Peyton Talbot. When I came into this, it's not that I think Talbot's going to lose. It's that I think that it is going to be close and go the distance. And boy, oh boy, is that going to be one heck of a sweat with like a max yeah. seven unit bet on a fight that could be close and go the distance between two guys I think that do have positive upside. The, the thing that we saw Simon really struggle with, not only in, in this most recent fight, but in others like regionally, the wrestling defense, I don't think Talbot... I don't think that's his thing. Like, I think he's much more of, I said on the contender series, he reminded me of like a better 135 prospect of like an Alex Caceres, the way he moves, the way that he varies his strike. And, and honestly, the Afro probably contributed as well. But um, like, you know, I saw a similar type of guy to that. I don't know if offensive wrestling is ever going to be Peyton Talbot's thing. So um, I, I do think the grappling upside goes in Simon's direction here, how much it actually matters. Who knows? Because I, Aguirre for all of his faults, he can grab a double leg, like he can switch onto a single, like he knows how to wrestle. Um, and Talbot pretty much stopped all of those advances, which which was yeah. a good sign for him. I actually think it's a probably a good live betting opportunity for Talbot yep. after round one, too. Sure. Just because he's generally a, a slower starter. Yep. Like he was minus 800 to, to start the fight against Aguirre, and then he was down to like minus 150 or minus 200, somewhere around there. Yeah. And I was like, I got to take this. Like, <laughs> I don't think he's losing this fight. So I, yeah. I hammered it at that point, and I, I could see a similar thing here. Like, Talbot's getting his reads. Simon's probably you know, hitting some leg kicks, maybe some body kicks, uh, and looking good in round one, but I think Talbot will take over later. Yeah. We are concerningly still too close to the point where Cameron Simon was losing minutes to Steven Kozlo for my liking, um, that that I'm, like, all in at this point. So, like, <laughs> I, I totally get the Talbot side. Like, I've, I've wrestled with it all week, but I – I, I think it should be a heck of a scrap. So so maybe that'll be a parlay piece for us if I can talk you into it. But we'll move forward here. We got three fights left coming in. Um, and I was actually able to model two of them, not not these, not the co-main event, but this one as well. Edmund Shabazian taking on AJ Dobson. This is short notice. Dobson initially was supposed to draw Dushko Todorovic. Now Shabazian steps in on short notice, looking to pick up a win and kind of get himself righted in the right direction. A guy that's had a UFC made event, had big fights, ranked fights. Hasn't gone his way, but he's only 26. I never would have guessed that from how long he's been in yeah. UFC. Like this dude's been in UFC since I was in college and he's 26. So still really intriguing fight with a veteran in Dobson who's much older, more on the regional scene. Um, I, I do think it's peculiar. So curious what you're thinking in this guy. Yeah, I mean, this. I think this is a fight that Shabazian should win. Sure. Like, I don't rate uh, Dobson as a dangerous fighter. I don't really think he's got a high ceiling. Mm -hmm. but there's a, a way that he could win this fight. Like it's yeah. hang with Shabazi and early yep. win at least two thirds of the, the second round, win the third round, win by decision. I don't think he's going to finish Shabazi. And I just don't think he's that type of fighter to, uh, sure. you know, let it all out there at, at any point. And especially if he's taking this on short notice, I don't know if he'll have the gas tank to like finish him later in the fight. Like we know Shabazi and Shabazi on short notice. Dobson's on a full can. Oh, is he really? Yeah, I thought it was the other way. No, no, Shabazian stepping in for Dushko uh, here. Oh, well, then I'm on, I'm I'm completely off then. Well, either way, Shabazian's yeah. going to be dangerous early, and yep. uh, if he's taking this on short notice, then uh, it's not going to be good for him later. The bright side for him there is Dobson's not going to like put him on it, put it on him early either way. Yep. So it's like if if Shabazian can do what he does early and not gas himself out. I think he should be able to win this fight. And now if he goes in there trying to finish him in the first round and gasses himself out, it's not going to look good at minus 210. Like, I think Shabazian is skill for skill better than Dobson everywhere. Maybe not off his back. Like, <laughs> Dobson, <laughs> path to victory here is to take him down and smother him. Sure. Um, And, and could he do that? Sure. But at then, then we're talking... Dobson doesn't really land any damage when he's on the ground. He's mostly just kind of holding you there and taking right. the position. Uh, so that's going to hurt him. Uh, it's one of these fights where I think Shabazi at a minus 210, it's like, uh, do you don't want to pay that price? He's one and four in his sure. last five. But at the end of the day, I just think he's the better fighter. I, I'm going to pick him to win. I don't know if I'll bet on it, but uh, Dobson doesn't really get me flowing. Yeah, and I do want to call a timeout real quick. Hey, Jive, correct. Austin, wrong. My notebook was backwards. It is Dobson on short notice, not Todorovic, which is really interesting go. to me. When I think, 
I, when I, I think this is kind of a tough matchup for Dobson. It's a little weird that he went into it willingly. Boy, Shabazi would have smoked Dusko Todorovic. I can't believe that matchup was made initially. That, that wouldn't even have been competitive. I think Dobson, a little bit more reliable in those departments. He's had a weird career where, like, ended up on bottom of Jacob Malkoon so often. Um, you know, like, had had that fight against uh, Armin Petrosian where – he was having success getting into the ground, but he kind of gave up on the game plan about halfway through, ended up losing that one. Like, I don't love Dobson's fight IQ. I will say I'm a little higher on the Tufan and Chukwe than some other guys are. I think he's got really nice Muay Thai, and Dobson was able to outpoint him at distance. He manages distance well there, even landed a couple of takedowns. Here's the thing that is so interesting about Shabazi, you know, is we've seen the formula over again. Start strong, kind of start to fade and gas as the fight goes on. He's a guy that carries a lot of muscle mass at 185. So you give me Dobson double chance plus 410 as far as like will Shabazi and death gas. I don't know how I feel about that because of what you're saying is that Dobson necessarily doesn't put out the volume. Like Anthony Hernandez was a horrible matchup for Shabazi. Oh, like he's, terrible. he was going to bring the pace and the pressure. And like, I thought Shabazi might have success like in the striking department early, but then Hernandez was going to roll like he did yeah. later into that fight. So I think uh, D- Dobson's lack of offense does hurt him there. Now, when I modeled this fight, I have Shabazi in around minus 130, so I don't see value on the minus 210 money line. Interestingly, I've got it 58.6% to go the distance, which means really what I might keen in on here is Shabazi in plus 310 by points. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm actually, I believe I'm showing value on that because, uh, let's see, that is... I should have done this math already, but that's 24.4% implied. I've got it at 31.5%. And I kind of like that. Even, you know, Shabazian managing his energy really needs to get back into the win column. It's kind of a sloppier, he is able to control a guy in Dobson that doesn't put out a lot of volume. Like he said, he's not, I was talking earlier about Billy just kind of being nasty, using his elbows and things. Dobson's the opposite. Like I, I don't yeah. see any dog in the guy whatsoever. Um, and, and I kind of that's what I when he came in against and he was like close to a pick him against Malcoon in his debut. I'm like, I don't really see what everyone else sees with this guy coming off the contender series. It's kind of proven out to be that way. So while overall I think there would be betting value on Dobson, I'm not rushing to grab it. I haven't, I certainly haven't bet it yet. I think maybe like it goes the distance Shabazzian by decision angle is, is the way I, I'll choose to approach this one. Cause I think he is a better guy. He's fought completely superior competition in every way. Like dude went 15 minutes with Jack Hermanson. I, I know everyone's laughing at Jack's pillow hands, but you know, then he's also been in there with Derek Brunson. He's been in there with, um, Anthony Hernandez. So like, you know, level competition, much better. I think it is a fight. Edmund should win. I think he plays it safe. So that's kind of my angle yeah. to it. Yeah, I agree. I, I initially thought this fight probably goes the distance. And then I'm yeah. like, do I want to pay minus 210 on a fight that's going to go the distance? And Shabazi and probably going to lose the third round. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, but the th- plus 310 on Shabazi by points doesn't seem too bad. Yeah, I'm going to really struggle with whether or not I want to hit plus 140 to go the distance or plus 310 Edmund by points just because of how MMA judging can be. But like, I'd be very surprised if Dobson was able to cleanly win two of these rounds, you know, unless it was right. a Shabazi and death gas situation, at which point I'd rather have his inside the distance number anyway. So my two bets in this fight might be Shabazi and points Dobson inside the distance is like a small play, small play, because we haven't really seen any right. finishing danger from him at all. Just in case of the death gas. That's, that's probably my angle. I think what's a uh, Dobson round two or round three. So Dobson round two overall is thirteen hundred, and Dobson round three nineteen hundred plus plus nineteen hundred. So thirteen and nineteen to one. Yeah, it's pretty juicy, but at the end of the day, I don't know if Dobson's got the the dog in him to fi- find the fish. Yeah. <laughs> even at like, that point. part of gassing a dude out is throwing a lot of volume out there. Yeah, and Dobson, exactly. About nine significant strikes per minute attempted is very average. Hasn't really put a lot of wrestling pace on anybody, and frankly. I don't think he's really had anybody in trouble. Like that's, that's my biggest concern is like this price isn't wide enough to a point where I want a guy who's going to barely squeak out two rounds. If that makes yeah, sense. I agree. So we'll move forward here to the co-made event. Um, I wonder if we're going to disagree on this because I almost always disagree on top of fights. So we'll <laughs> see, we'll see what you're thinking here. Carl Williams taking on Justin Toffa. I got to say Carl Williams has exceeded my low UFC expectations for him took down Lucas Brezky over and over again at the uh, the hotel Virgin Hotels card last year, and then outboxed Chase Sherman. Didn't have a lot of success with his takedowns there, but was able to get by him. He's two and zero in UFC. Now taking on another guy in Justin Taffa that's had his ups and his downs, had some really high ups and also had some really low downs. So um, 
low-ish level heavyweight, but we know why this is the co-main. It's because Justin is now standing in for Junior after Junior subbed in for uh, Justin back at UFC 298 when he stepped in on a day's notice. Now Justin took this fight from Junior, so they kind of swapped roles here. That's kind of cool. What are you What are you thinking in this co-main here, bud? Yeah, they did the little switcheroo. Uh, yeah. And I think this is a tougher fight for Cara Williams just for the sure. fact that Junior Taffa got smothered by Mo Usman. And I think Carl yeah. Williams would have an easier job doing that to uh, Junior Taffa. So it's a tougher fight for Carl Williams. Yeah. But then at the end of the day, I, th I think he should probably win this fight because yeah. he's got the wrestling. And he's really looked pretty damn good, like, doing it. Like, I, I faded him on the contender series, and uh, he cashed as an underdog there against Jimmy Lawson, who's, like, this great wrestler, and he yep. completely out-wrestled him. So I'm like... Maybe Jimmy Lawson's either a fraud or Carl Williams is like pretty damn good. Yeah. And then he comes in the UFC and he's like ragged on Lucas Dresky. And I'm like, okay, this guy's pretty damn good wrestler. Pretty yeah. Athletic too. I mean, I know he's a ex light heavyweight. He was a 205er and then he found his way into the UFC through, through heavyweight, which makes sense, but he carries the athleticism with it. And, and like I think, Al Almeida, right? A little similar yeah. to Almeida. Yeah. Not as good as Almeida as far as yeah. athleticism and, and jujitsu yeah. and everything, but yeah, sim similar, very similar uh, type of build, I would say. Um, and Carl Williams' last fight against Chase Sherman, the wrestling didn't look as dominant, but like he showed he could stand and strike with guys. But I also watched the tape on that, and I'm like, not very clean with the striking. So sure. I, like at this this point. I, I, it's a fight that I think Carl Williams should be able to win because he can get the takedowns. Uh, I know Tafa has – everybody knows Tafa has, like, the 100% takedown defense, but it doesn't really mean anything because he's yeah. got, like, two takedown defenses or whatever. Yeah, yeah. He's still, like, six foot, and he's, like, a fire hydrant. So it's like, yep. I don't know, maybe he is pretty tough to take down. So that yeah. raises some concerns. And then if it gets into – if they're in the pocket, like, I think Justin Tafa is going to be so much cleaner – yeah, uh, and I watched the striking from Carl Williams, and it, he's hitting dudes with like his wrists, like he's not yep. even throwing punches sometimes. So that makes me scared for Carl Williams. I don't know, probably not a bet, or not probably not a fight I'll have like a, a bet on, as far as a money line. Uh, may that may look like for some props as far as a Carl Williams by decision, sure. Um, or uh, if the Tafa round one KO is like juicy enough for for that, I could, I could probably look at that, but. Overall, a fight I think Carl Williams should win. It's just if he doesn't, he's going to get caught. Yeah, and you know, this is my advice to anybody looking to bet it, Justin Taffa. It's not not ever my cup of tea, either he or Junior, because five UFC wins between them, all of them knockouts within two minutes. Like, literally, the win condition for beating the Taffas is surviving two minutes. And some guys yeah. haven't been able to do it. You look at Justin Taffa's four UFC wins as I've unsuccessfully faded him. Austin Lane, Parker Porter, Harry Hunsucker, Juan Adams. So that is like a murderer's <laughs> row of awful heavyweights. And Parker um, Porter twice. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, Porter got Tafa twice, right? Yeah. I mean, it's just guys with iffy chins that don't have very much upsides themselves when you sit, like you said, I think Williams is a good athlete. He's shown a decent chin to this point because, like, Sherman has decent power. Like, it, it's not the best power in the world, but he's put guys out before. Um, but, like, the thing that I struggle with, it, it, just, Justin Tafa plus 430 first round knockout. If you like him, bet it. Just bet plus 430. But this is where I was sitting with Maddie and I was talking to him last week. I said, Tai Tuivas is hanging out here round one knockout. What is every public Joe that comes to this fight looking to bet it going to take on Tai Tuivas? They're going to bet round one plus 270 <laughs> knockout or they're going to bet round two plus 750. And those numbers are long on FanDuel for a reason. I think it's because Williams is able to dent that takedown defense. I think he is able to get Tafa to the ground. The, interestingly, like the dart, I don't want to. I don't want to fade Justin Tafa's power and like have a substantial position. I think Carl Williams by submission plus six hundred is interesting here. I'm wondering if I can learn a mistake that I made last week where Marcin Tibera didn't have very much submission volume, but he was so much of a better guy that was training that in a decent gym, kind of like Williams is. And he was just way better at it, and he was able to get on the back and secure a rear naked choke and never let go. Six to one for that, when I expect his advantage and his win condition in this fight to be on the ground, is very interesting to me. Um, that's how I think I might support him. I don't want to have a huge stance here, but like, if I would feel better if Justin Toffa round one knockout was sitting around like plus 185, and I'm like, oh, okay, oddsmakers think it's decently likely that Toffa's going to chin this dude. I don't 
forecast that. And like, I'm never a guy that ends up on the top of gang. Like I I'm kind of a hater in that regard. I just don't think there's a lot of high level skill beyond the power with either of them. And Carl Williams is a guy that's already shown me more than I expected. I think the, the Lawson win that you referenced also held, held true with me. And I was very impressed by that. So, um, I, I think I got to take Williams here and, and I'm going to get creative to do it knowing that the Toffa gang might get me again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, and if for Carl Williams, like you get the opponent switch, but it's kind of the same guy, you know, it's it like, is literally the same guy, just a little bit shorter, a little bit pudgier. Yeah. Uh, but you know, you're seeing the same thing. Yeah. I, I, and I think like, I do agree with you that I think Junior was an easier matchup because of the physicality. He's not quite as large. He is hard, easier to take down. So it is a little harder from that perspective. But I think Williams might also have a little bit more speed relative to Justin here, um, which which could be which could be a factor too. So I, I think the same matchup is why UFC did it. I think it's hilarious because analytically, like when I look at my spreadsheet, they are the same guy. Like they have the same yeah. peripheral, same knockdown rate, same win conditions. Like it's it's all the same. So um, we'll we'll sub one in for another, and like uh, we'll see if Justin can fare a little better than his brother Junior, who he is a fan favorite. Like I don't I don't want to root against the guy. I just I I just you know, you have to do this independently, but we will move forward at long last 12 fights in to a main event. That is not the raucous most lo- can't miss main event at the apex ever. Amanda Hibas and Rose Nami Yunus, former straw weight contenders. This fight, I believe, Hey Jive is happening at 125. everywhere. I've said 125. That's what it sounds yeah. like. Rose made that permanent transition. So interesting betting activity here as well. Rose Nami Yunus currently setting minus 235 on FanDuel. Hey, Jive, your initial thoughts about this main event and, and kind of the dynamic of the fight to you? Yeah, banger of a main event. Uh, and why not just, you know, throw it at a, a flyweight because these are two 115ers that are, are just going to, you know, decide to fight at flyweight. I guess Rose has made the transition and that's where she wants to be. But Amanda yeah. Hebos is like back and forth every other fight. So it's like yeah. pick, a, pick a division. Like, which one do you want? <laughs> and uh, she's like, all right, I take a loss here. I'll go to the other one. If I get a win, then I'll go back to the other one or whatever. So it's like, it, it's it's weird for Amanda Hebos because I don't know what her, like, path is. Like, what, we don't know what which division she's really in. And if I guess she's just taking this fight because it's a main event and it's against a big name mm-hmm. against Rose. It's an yep. opportunity uh, to get a, you know, a statement win. And I look at her fights and it's just like, it leaves a little bit to des- be desired. Like her last fight against Pinheiro, she was just getting mm-hmm. the, the shit kicked out of her for like a round and a half. And then mm-hmm. she survives. She turns it on. Pinheiro gasses out. She looks great. She ends up getting yeah. the, you know, the bonus and it looks like a great win. But if you look at the first couple of rounds, she was getting pieced up and sure. against, against Rose, like she's not going to fade. So if, if you're getting pieced up by Pinheiro, I would assume Rose with the more technical striking, she'd be able to, to touch you. The same way. I know Pinero yep. probably throws a little bit harder. Uh, sits down on her strikes, but Rose is a lot more technical. Sure. A little bit more patient. Um, and I think Rose, with the experience, especially in five rounds, like if Hebus has never been five rounds, we don't know how our cardio is going to show up, you know, at yep. those fourth and fifth. Rose has been there before. The only question marks on Rose at this point is like, which version of Rose is going to show up? Is it the Sparza that... She stared at for five rounds and landed, sure. what, 35 significant strikes against? Or is it the Rose that had kick knocked out Zhang Wei Li? Yeah, or, yeah. Uh, or even went five rounds with Zhang Wei Li and won that one. So, I mean, mm-hmm. she could do it all. It's just we don't know which, which version is going to show up. Now, I don't know. Maybe you could give me a, a lean as far as does it help for Rose to be in the apex or does – like she's used to fighting in front of thousands of fans. And now yeah. she's in the apex. So like, I don't know if that helps her because she's kind of a little nutcase yeah. or if it hurts her because she's not going to have the energy to go out there with like the fans screaming at her. What do you think? Yeah, that, that's a really, I actually had that jotted down. This is her first fight at the apex. I think it is different. Um, A little weird stuff going on with Rose. Trevor Whitman, not going to be in the corner this weekend. It'll be Pat Berry head coach again, just like it was against men on Fioro. So um, a little, a little weird there when Whitman is such a helpful adjuster between rounds, especially these five rounders. I, I think it's a slight downgrade to Rose there. As far as the apex environment, it might help her, might help with a focus thing, um, which where we've seen Rose can sometimes 
her own worst enemy can be herself in terms of focus, in terms of taking the right game plan. The Esparza fight was inexcusable from both of those ladies. I, I expected a little bit more from Carla because she's just not super efficient all the time. And she's, you know, <laughs> but, but like Rose's hesitancy was why that fight looked like it did. So you have to be concerned about that if you're laying minus 235 in a money line parlay, right? Um, right. It has to be well within your range of outcomes here. I, uh, I, I don't disagree with your sentiment whatsoever. I think the the concerning thing for Hibas, like you said, is the recent form. Before the Pinheiro fight, which wasn't going her way early and she kind of outlasted Luana, was the Macy Barber fight. That was a one-way freight train, right? Where Macy looked yeah. as violent as dominant as ever. I don't think she's a 125 or I think it's a bad weight class for her, but the fact it's Rose kind of helps mitigates those concerns because really, like you said, it is two blown up straw weights. So um, we, we get that here. I've always liked Amanda, like her defensive efficiency really shines in like my model, 63% striking defense, 87% takedown defense. I will stand by. She should have got the Chukagian decision like that. To me, yeah. she won that fight pretty clearly. Um, and then really some intriguing fights that aged better for her. The Verna Jandy Hoba fight she pulled away from Verna has been on a run really outclassed Viviara Ujo at this 125 division. So that was like where her volume ended up winning out. I could see a similar story for her this week where Rose just by and large looking at her metrics is very inconsistent with her volume, right? Like right. Um, even the fight against Wele, the second one was very, very close in the margins. You could have easily gone 48, 47 Wele in that spot. I expect he his cardio to be pretty good um, just based on her pace in three rounders. Like you said, we won't know until she gets there. I think it's baked into the price tag. I'm very into he at this number. I've got her 52.8% likely to win. And I get her at plus 180, so that kind of makes sense on a money line. Um, I kind of lean more of like a points fight. Like, I think my favorite bet in this fight might actually be to go the distance at plus 132. Rose has these signature moments, the head kick, the knockout of Joanna Yedjacek, that are very, very quick, like early finishes. Other than that, it's a lot of decision trends and a lot of length. And I think Hebos is not someone that has a lot of high level finishing danger either. Like I feel like the jujitsu is very good on both sides here. Like yeah. both ladies, I think know what they're doing in that regard. Um, I think a very key attribute of this fight could be he is historically a pretty efficient wrestler and Rose has struggled with that at time. Takedown defense, just 60% Wele wasn't able to keep going in their fight against each other, but she had success with it early. I can see he having some success in that regard ended up being on top, but I expect to be the margins to be pretty close here. I'm leaning for this fight to go the distance, and so is my model, by the way. It's got 71.5%, so I'm way wow. above market on that. I think Rose knockout is mispriced here. Like To me, that was a slow too. yeah, slow eventual beatdown by Macy Barber. And then Hebos really had that one moment against Marina Rodriguez. I don't have a good high grade on Rose's power, just 0.57% knockdown rate, and Hebos is almost non-existent. So like when I'm thinking in practicality how one of these ladies would finish each other, I don't really see a lot of it. So like I'm leaning goes the distance that tends to go with an underdog just because of how MMA judging can be. And I think he can win minutes with her wrestling. So I, I kind of lean Amanda in this spot. I, I think I'm almost concerned about an injury with the fight looking this way because I was so confident modeling it on Sunday. And now it looks different where Rose KO has, has gone way out of control. Rose's money line has gone out of control. It almost makes me wonder if Amanda has an undisclosed injury or something because this fight was much closer on Sunday. It was like minus 180 Rose plus 130 on Hebus. Yeah. I felt like that was more appropriate. Um, so I'm a little trepidatious, but um, I am going to fire it. Fight goes the distance and, and Hebus's money line here. Yeah, one thing I like to do, and I know you're a stats guy, so you probably do the same thing. Was like just look at the stats, and like yep. cover their their names. Just look at the yeah. stats, and I looked at it. I'm like, Andy Hebus actually has like better stats in like most yeah. most categories. So I'm like, you know, I can't really counter out. And then, you know, the reason that the KO price is like so low is like, okay, Mandy Mandy Hebus been knocked out three times. They're like, they know Rose for the head kick. Yep. Uh, and it's just, it seems way too low. I'm like, I, I would almost never pay a plus 180 on a women's KO, yep. let alone yep. like a Rose that's might not even throw anything that's very significant. You know, sure. <laughs> like, like how, how can I pay plus 180 for Rose that, that stared at Carlos Barza? I could never do that. I couldn't live with myself if I did that. Yeah. So, do you feel like she was tentative in the Fioro fight as well? I felt like it came across a little tentative for those 15 minutes too. 
yeah, I was I was pretty heavy on Benoît Fierro, and that fight was actually was closer than I thought it would be. Uh, sure. I guess she had that like injury in the first round with her thumb yeah. or something like that. I don't know if that played a factor, but I didn't think she really, you know, sat down on anything. I, I, mm -hmm. I kind of expected Fierro to just be landing the more significant strikes and and uh, use her weight to just kind of bully her around. It's kind of mm -hmm. what happened. It was a little bit closer than I thought it would, but she ultimately got the win. But yeah, it's just I don't really see Rose going in there like, all right, this girl is fragile in some areas. Like I'm gonna go out there and put it on her. Like, I just don't yeah. see her doing that. So it's it's a weird spot for the KO prop to be like that. It, like it almost yeah. does make you wonder if there's like some type of injury on the Hebos side. Yeah, it really does. I, I'm scared to death about it. But like, I I love that you pointed that out about the stats. I think the thing that I always encourage people that are starting to get into UFC stats, always factor in level of competition. My That's what I built my model basically to do. And it's got both of these ladies level of competition in the 90th percentile or better at women's straw weight. So I think you can cover the names, look at the stats, and it's pretty even. And Hebos does have a lot of significant advantages, like you said. Now, you always have to mentally weigh the the context of, oh, well, Rose had that 25-minute stinker against Esparza. Right, That's right, going right. to drag down yeah. all of her averages. But from an efficiency perspective, I think it's pretty close. And, like, that's where I, I tend to lean Hebas at plus 180. So, um, yeah. interesting. Yeah, I'm, gl I'm glad you're on the same page about knockout because that was my first – when I pulled this fight up on FanDuel, I'm like, holy, who's paying Rose plus – what is it, plus 120? Let, let me take a look here. Plus Isn't 155. Really Plus 155 now for knockout. And it's like plus 180. I'm like, there's no way I'm touching that. And now it's yeah. plus 155. I'm like, good Lord. That's, uh, this doesn't make sense. Divisional trends, women's straw weight, highest decision rate by a mile in UFC. So like, I'm not paying plus 150 something for yeah. an individual outcome like that. When I think Rose has submission upside too, I, like I said, I think it cancels it out, but, um, it, intriguing. So if you, so with a straight pick, you would go Rose here. Yeah, I think Rose has the skills uh, to get the victory. Um, yeah. And I, I think she's just, she's so skilled. It's like, just go out there and do it. You know, just, like, that's the only yeah. hesitation. It's like, does she go out there and do it? You know? Yeah. But yeah, I think, I think she should probably win. Um, one last thing I want to ask you before we, we go to build a parlay. What do you think about a split decision type of prop here? Rose has been in a ton over the years, like back and forth. I think it's because some of her rounds can be ambiguous because of that lack of volume at times. Yeah. Um, I don't, there's Fanduel doesn't offer those, but other books do like, what do you think about a split in this spot? I think it'd be live. Uh, I was going to ask you what the decision props are for both ladies. What, what's the uh, number? So Rose by decision plus 260, I think that's a good number if you like Rose. And then Amanda plus 460, I think is a good number if you like Amanda. So I, I like both of those. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think, uh, I don't think Amanda finishes her. And honestly, if it goes to a decision, you probably want the dog. Uh, I mean, yeah. Plus 460 for Hebos is not too bad. Yeah. Um, uh, we just got to hope there's no injury. I do kind of like the, the split decision. I, I, I wonder what it is as far as odds goes. Yeah, I'd, I'd have to look on a book that wasn't yeah. FanDuel, which, which would be not good for me. But, like, Rose has surprised me before where I feel like she's low volume in general, but then do you remember she took she took this rematch off Joanna Jacek, out-volumed her, was more was more active yeah. in that fight. It, she's so weird to handicap, man. Like, whereas, yeah. like, Rose, I think if I got her as, like, a plus 170 dog against a top 15 straw weight, sign me up, but laying the chalk is like, oh, my God, is she going to actually yeah. show up? I think I think your your concerns echo that sentiment. So, yeah. Let's move one on thing, here. One thing. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. DFS thing. Uh, yeah. You mentioned the the young Jacek fight where she yeah. out volumed her. That was the only fight in her entire career. She went over ninety five and a half significant strikes. Yep. And on, is that uh, the number? That's the number ninety five and a half. It's like, I mean, she could finish her, and that probably goes under and if it goes to a decision she could probably go under like she's been to a, a few decisions five round decisions that she went under 95 and a half so i'm like yeah that just seems way too high also you got to factor in like grappling uh i'm sure rose is probably going to shoot at some point he boss mm -hmm. might shoot so yep i think the the under on that is is money I, I do too. Like I've got Hebas 81.3% likely to win the distance strike differential. So like to have more distance strikes than Rose. So um, I, it depends like, and Rose historically has been someone that's been tough to score on. You look at Wayley's results, 83 significant strikes, Andrade 71. 
Like Yoana at 145 was the only one that popped over 100. So if I think Kibas is going to lead the dance and Rose is a, a tough and Rose is a tough cookie to crack. Both these ladies have over 60% striking defense. They both have been very mindful of that. And like it's significant strikes landed, not attempted. And like that makes that adds a dis- difference. So I, I like the under there on that number as well, wherever you might get it. I like it. Cool. Sorry to cut so, you off. Go ahead. No, I, I ask me, cut me off for DFS questions all you would like. But um, let's see if we have some, the opportunity to do something really funny here. We don't really have a specific way we do this. We just typically try to build a, a parlay at the end of the show. We've tried a couple, we each picked an individual outcome prop for 20 to 1. We've tried 5 to 1. We've tried 10 to 1. Yeah, we do. We just typically do whatever feels right for the card. So when I say, "Hey, we're going to build a parlay for all the viewers here," that's probably you know five to one, ten to one, somewhere in that neighborhood. What leg stands out to you on this week's card? Like, hey, I think that's got to be in there. I mean, well, we we talking like how how big are the odds? Are we talking? For, well, I mean, so one? we could build up like three or four legs. Typically, is what Maddie and I we have this weird synergy where we just kind of know what we want to build from a parlay perspective. Like okay. the one that I wanted to throw at you that came to mind right away, Simon Talbot over because I would never straight bet that go to the distance at minus one seventy two. I would throw it in a fun parlay like this, and that's it goes to distance. That's kind of what um, uh, the leg that stood out to me first. Okay. So if, if I if I put that in there, why don't we make a a distance parlay? Okay, okay. I, I think we we talked about a few fights that we think could probably go the distance. Yeah, that I'm, one I'm, being the first I'm, one. I'm heavy on length there. What about um, boy Shabazi and Dobson would be plus coins, so that would make it go up very quick. But I I don't know if I that I think there is a chance Edmund does finish him. Um, it's the exact opposite. So plus, it's minus 174, no. Plus 138, yes. On Maybe that that's not the best fit. Um, let's talk Ogden about Hollibaugh, could add that one. Oh, to go the distance? You like that one? Yeah, I like that one. Cool. We'll, we'll add that guy. Minus 122, go the distance. So plus 187. And then... Wh- I'm looking out here. What do you think about Quarantillo Zalal? I like that one as well. Yeah, it's minus 235. So that's plus 310, those three legs. So maybe if we do another one to go the distance, that could be... That Main could event? be... Money. Yeah, I mean, like that, and that would bump us up. I, I'm so far above market on that. But can you imagine if we hit the first three legs of this and then there's an injury in the main event? You and I will both be sick. <laughs> you and I will both be yeah. sick. Of course, but, after uh, we talked about it too, that'd be just, I'd probably be <laughs> thrown up in the bathroom at that point. Yeah, but plus 130... Takes it to plus 851. I really like that. As like a mid-range parlay, four fights to go the distance. Uh, Simon Talbot, Holabao Ogden, Quarantel Zalal, and then Hibas Namajunas. I really like that. I like it. Like, I'll lock yeah, it in. Well, well, yeah, me too. And, and by the way, I always track uh, Maddie Betts Show Parlay every week. I'll put it on my card, my full card that I release to the Discord. I know Hey releases his full card to the Discord as well. Where else can they find you, my friend? I want to make sure to plug your stuff for, for filling in today. Yes, sir. Just uh, at Hey Jive Picks on all the medias, most active on Instagram. Uh, try to read all the DMs. Can't always get to them, uh, yeah. but try to stay engaged with the audience. At Hey Jive Picks on all the medias. And then, of course, you can chop it up with me in the, the Home of Fight Discord. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm so grateful for Hey Jive for coming on, filling in for me today. As always, a reminder for you guys, I will have my full fight by fight breakdown, full analysis, all that. Vandal.com slash research slash UFC. That'll publish tomorrow on Friday. I'll also have the podcast over on the FanDuel Research Podcast tab. If you want to track all my, I track all my bets, betmma.tips slash aswame3, but I've also been putting the full card in the Home of Fight Discord. That's just the place to be. If you want AJ, if you want me, join the Home of Fight Discord. I, I try to send out a leak, link to join every week. We got good stuff going on there. Lots of different guys giving out picks. Good discourse. I saw some discourse on the main event uh, total earlier this week with some other guys leaning over four and a half. I think we have a sharp crew in there. So appreciate your support. Support. Again, hey Jive, appreciate you filling in. You guys know Hey Jive here on the Home of Fight podcast. We have so much good stuff going on here. He, uh, you do the double leg, right, with uh, with the parlay yep. as well. Um, that show released earlier this week. You guys record before us, and then we got Clint McLean doing the Die Hard podcast every Monday. Make sure to subscribe over to the YouTube channel so you don't miss any of that. I appreciate everybody for tuning in today. It was a great one. We agreed a lot. We agreed disagreed in some areas, but I feel smarter for it. Thank you very much, and until next time, hope your bets hit and enjoy the fights on Saturday.